Questions 27 and 28 in the Acer purple paper. Question 27. So what we've got here is we've got a scenario where blood is moving along the length of a capillary and two forces are acting on it. One is the hydrostatic pressure and that force is an outwards force. It's, it's causing fluid to leave the capillary. On the other hand, we have osmotic pressure and osmotic pressure is an inwards force. So it's causing um, fluid to enter the capilla capillary. So we have osmotic inwards and hydrostatic outwards. So what each of these forces are, well, I'd make sure to look them up at home. But basically, hydrostatic pressure occurs as the blood is under pressure. So say we have um, a hose and it's attached to a, a tap. And um, basically what happens is a hole is kind of poked into the side of the hose. So that when we turn it on, well, we know what will happen. What's going to happen is all that water is going to um, either come out the end of the hose or some of it is going to spurt out this little hut. Um, this little hole and the force slash pressure that is causing the water to come out of that hole is the hydrostatic pressure Now the exact same thing is happening in our capillaries So our capillaries aren't actually this long continuous structure where if no gaps in between them They're very leaky. There's lots of holes in between them. So there's lots of opportunity for the um, fluid in our blood to escape via this hydrostatic pressure. So we've got this hydrostatic pressure that's pointing outwards and the osmotic pressure, well, it's just due to the fact that um, our blood seems to have more particles in it than the surrounding fluid, interstitial fluid, etc. And therefore there is an osmotic gradient which leads to water slash fluid um, being attracted into the blood. So what would happen if the hydrostatic pressure was very low as per question 27? Well, if the hydrostatic pressure was very low, then we'd expect there to be net movement of fluid into the blood, oh, sorry, into yeah, the blood in the capillaries because the osmotic pressure is unchanged, but the hydrostatic pressure, the outward pressure has gone down. So therefore C is the correct answer for question 27. Moving on to question 28. Which of the following best helps explain why osmotic pressure is reasonably consistent along the capillary? Well, A, permeability to protein increases along the capillary. Well, this would re actually result in a decrease in osmotic pressure along the length of the capillary because if permeability to protein increase along the capillary then what we'd see is more protein escaping from the capillary as time went on and therefore um, less solute in the blood along the length as we went along the length of the capillary and therefore a lower osmotic pressure as you go along that capillary so therefore a is the is not a correct answer for question 28. B, permeability to water and solutes increases along the capillary. Uh, B is fairly similar to A in that uh, you can just consider protein as a solute. So we're saying the exact same thing. The uh, If the permeability to solutes increases along the capillary, there'd be more escape of the solutes from the capillary out into the interstitial fluid and therefore um, we'd see a lower osmotic pressure as we went along it. C, proteins initially lost are largely replaced further along the capillary. Well, that is a pretty good answer, but let's just skip that and go to D, fluid and solutes initially lost are replaced, are largely replaced along the capillary. So the main difference between C and D is that fluids and solutes are, are replaced in D whilst only proteins are uh, replaced in the in C. And the important distinction is that whilst proteins are solutes, 
proteins are not all the solutes in the capillary. So therefore we'd, we'd want to not only replace protein, but any other sort of solutes in the uh, blood in the capillary. So therefore for question 28, D is the correct answer.